Well, welcome back to Trojan Sports Now. And with the start of the season, we've got a very special guest this week, the voice of the Trojans, Barry McKnight. Barry, thank you for being here this week. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Like I said, the start of the season, it's exciting for the fans, the players, the coaches, but also exciting for you. You get to, to get your start your job all over again. Well, it's fun because, you know, for me, working with Troy is it's a year-round obsession although obsession is probably not the right word. I, I, but the actual work is between the end of August and the beginning of May. So it, it's about a nine month deal where constantly you're, you're paying attention to it and you're working and you're preparing and you're traveling and you're coming back and, and all that. So normally between June to the first or middle of August is really kind of downtime but this is about the time where it really starts getting back into the flow. And yes, it is exciting. Yeah, we got football season coming up and, and a lot of preparation goes into that. Uh, what do you do to get prepared for the season and for each game week? Well, the, the football, as opposed to the basketball and the baseball that I do, is, is preparation intensive. There's, at any time on the field, there's 22 different guys and you've right. got to know something about every one of those guys for both teams and the, and the two deeps for both teams. And so there's, there's a lot of preparation. As far as the season preparation, most of that is just organizational. Making sure you know your players, making sure that you know your commercials and your format. And when we do the, the, the uh, television show, the Trojan Football Report, and Aaron and Jeff help with that, making sure that you know what you're supposed to do there. So at the beginning of the season, it's all organizational. Usually there's some new coaches and you want to try to meet them. And that's always the fun part, really. I don't mind that at all. That's more the behind the scenes mm -hmm. stuff. But once the season gets started and you get into a routine with the next opponent and getting their two deep charts and knowing what they do on offense and what they do on defense and what they've done so far, season that's when you really get into the week by week routine one of the things that really helps me probably probably as much as anything that helps me is the fact that I love the preparation mm -hmm. I've always been kind of a homework guy I love doing that stuff and doing the the paperwork and filling out the, my spotting charts and and all that it's really I, I enjoy that very much the the, the game itself the actual game broadcast, if you, if you prepare well, and I've got a great crew, Jerry Miller and Chris Blackshear and all of, are just, just absolutely outstanding. If you do your homework and you do your preparation and you're diligent about it, the game itself just, just should just flow. Uh, if you know what you're doing and you know, what you've, you know what's, what's going on out there, the actual game broadcast is really the least stressful right. part of the whole week. Now, for the game, I mean, our offense doesn't have a lot of downtime in b between plays <laughs> when we run NASCAR and stuff like that, but what are you looking for to talk uh, during, uh, about between plays? It's, it's usually the way it works, our flow, is I call the play, mm -hmm. and if you'll notice on the radio broadcast, I'll call the play, the last thing I'll mention is down and distance. Mm -hmm. It's now second down and three from the 37. And Jerry, uh, my, my color announcer, comes in and recaps the play. Like you said, it has to be pretty quick because right. they're already lining up for right. another play, and then we'll, we'll lay out for about two seconds, and if Chris, our sideline reporter has something to say. That's his point there. So normally between plays, that's Jerry and Chris's time. And when they're done with whatever commentary or insight they have, by that time, in 10 or 15 seconds, they're ready to run another play. And that's when you s set up the next play. Right. So usually there's a flow. There's a, there's a set tempo. And, and once the NASCAR set gets going on offense, it really flows from <laughs> us. There's, there's not much time, there's not much dead air with this offense. Well, when we first started, when you first started here, that we weren't running that offense. Right. How much has it changed for you uh, going from just a slow in the huddle to this no huddle fast paced stuff? That's a good question. My, my tempo has not changed. Mm -hmm. I still do the same thing, call the play, set up the next play, and, and, and lay out for mm -hmm. Jerry. Where it really helps is for Jerry and Chris, <laughs> because there's that much more time back then between plays right. for them to talk about it and to, and, to, and to really get their points in with a little bit more time to embellish. So, so it, really, it really gives them more of an opportunity. For me, it's really the same tempo all in all, but the only thing that's different for me in the way we run our offense is you've got to be really concise 
every time. If, if I get off on a tangent or I'm too wordy, that really cuts into Jerry's and Chris's time, and that's, they don't have that much time anyway. When well, something else, you said it's important to make sure you know the players, because uh, a couple of years ago, 22 guys caught balls last year, 15. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you've got to make sure you know who all those guys are. Right, and you have to know it quickly. Yeah. It's not something that you can look down and hunt for a number or hunt for a name, because by the time that happens, the next play's already snapped. So, yeah, it does put a little bit more pressure on you. We have a spotter, Ryan Hayden, this year, who's in charge of making sure I know who makes the tackle, you know, who makes the catch, whether somebody tipped the pass, who made the interception, or who recovered the fumble. So I have a lot of help with that, but again, you have to, it, it's got to be quick. Right. Everything is quick, quick, quick with the way we run. Now with basketball and baseball, it, it kind of changes the, you don't have a lot of time in between games to get everything ready. So what do you do for preparation for those games? It, it's different because you don't have as many players to account for mm -hmm. at any one time. Uh, in basketball, we pretty much run the same style. I mean, everything is fast tempo there, so, so the mindset doesn't change. The only real difference with basketball is that there's no, there's no timeouts to stop the clock or mark the ball or anything like that. The, the, the action is free flowing. So it's not as much preparation, but again, you still have to know what's going on out there. The difference is, is that a lot of times in basketball, the preparation and the work between broadcasts takes place in a hotel room <laughs> or on a bus right. or waiting in the, in, in the Atlanta airport for a flight, things like that, because there's so many games back to back to back, particularly in the overlap between football and basketball, that you just got to take the advantage whenever you can to prepare right. and get ready. Well, and with something like baseball, you don't have as much knowledge of the other teams, the scattering of reports mm -hmm. as you do with something like football where the knowledge is really easy. How do you, how do you find the stuff about the other teams? Well, the best part about baseball is the fact that you've got time to do that. Mm -hmm. that, that, is, that is worlds different mm -hmm. doing a baseball broadcast than doing a, a football and mm -hmm. basketball broadcast because you have the time to do it. Quite frankly, in baseball, you want to know the bare bones about the opposition. When you get into the game, you don't want to be surprised by anything that they do, but you have time to look stuff right. up. You, you know, you'll mention sometimes, I'll notice this batter has you know, hit 229 last year, he's hitting 375 this year. Things like that where you actually have time. Baseball is my favorite sport to broadcast because you do have that time. And Jerry Miller is really good at this as well, where you have the time to, to flesh out a subject or tell right. a story or make an observation, and you have time to, to look up something or to reflect upon something that you just absolutely don't in a football or basketball broadcast. Well back to football I know a lot of people are looking forward to hearing you say touchdown men of Troy this year many times. <laughs> How did that come about? Was that something you took time to? to well it's a, it's a good question because I because I know in, in the sports casting industry and in the play-by-play -play world that there's always that that fine line. You don't want to come up with hackneyed phrases. You don't want to come up with something just for the sake of coming right. up with something. I've got to find a catchphrase or I've got to I've got to have a signature call or anything like that. But uh, the, the, the actual touchdown men of Troy, I'm not one of those who, who was looking for a mm -hmm. catchphrase. It was so organic. Uh, it just it just happened. The first time that Troy scored a touchdown in my first year, which was 2002, I, that, that's what I said. I hadn't pre-planned it and the fans seemed to like it and I got a lot of good response for that so I've, I've done it ever since. And um, it's sort of become a signature thing which is curious for me because I've never been a signature <laughs> call kind of guy. It just, it just sort of happened. So how, you've been here since 2002. Have mm -hmm. there been uh, any standout moments, any calls that have just been your favorite? Oh, there have been, there have been a lot of those. In football, everybody mentions the miracle in Murfreesboro right. because you could, and when, when Gary Banks caught the touchdown pass from Omar Hogabook in, in Murfreesboro to win the game, it was such a progression that you could, you could see it coming. Right. And therefore, as a broadcaster, that is manna from heaven. When you can see it building up and you can set the stage and you can and you know that boy now we've recovered the onside kick we've got a chance to win this you can actually build your broadcast excitement because you know that that the stakes in this game have all of a sudden gotten so much bigger that was always a good one strictly because of, of about a 15 minute stretch where I thought we did some of our best broadcasting we've ever done that's always good there's a lot of good baseball ones of course and you know the the, the Atlantic Sun Conference Championship, the Sun Belt Conference Championship in 06. There were so many great moments there. Bo Brooks had a home run mm -hmm. at Troy to beat Auburn yeah. in extra innings. That was always a lot of fun. And in basketball, the last two years have been, have been 
really good. You know, we've won championships in the Atlantic Sun, and we've won championships in the Sun Belt, and the, to clinch some of those and, and to win at Arkansas have been, um, have been some really memorable calls. There's been a lot of them. That's one of the things I love about being at Troy. When we played in the Sun Belt Conference Baseball mm -hmm. Championship, the, the tournament championship this past year in Murfreesboro, we were talking with some of the other broadcasters from the other schools, and they were calling me a good news broadcaster because every year that I've been here, and this is my ninth, Troy has won at least one championship. Right. I've gotten at least one ring every year, <laughs> and most of those guys have never gotten any. So, you know, I have had the opportunity to call a lot more great moments than a lot of people have that at their schools, and I am certainly thankful for Make it that. easy for you. It, it's exactly <laughs> right. It's much easier being a good news broadcaster than it is being a bad news broadcaster. Okay, well, what about a moment that maybe wasn't as easy to set up the, the Junior Lewisant run uh, against Missouri? Talk about that one. That was a shock. That was the, the, the problem with that one was that you, you had, like you said, you had no <laughs> idea what was about to happen. It was a against Missouri and oh it was such an exciting game and such an exciting <laughs> build up and you know you were we fell behind 14 early and you want to keep your you know you focus on it because it looked like things were going right. to go south really quickly and then um, DeWitt Betterson ran for about 18 or 20 yards and it was an exciting play it was a big play and then all of a sudden I saw Lewisant running uh -huh. and he was trailing the play I didn't see it come out of DeWitt's hands all of a sudden, I saw Lewisant, and I saw the ball in his hand, and the play-by-play -play call goes something like Betterson for 18 yards. Now here's the lineman. This is Lewisant. <laughs> Lewisant's got the ball, and he's heading downfield. That was such a surprise that I'm surprised I was able to catch up and actually keep pace with the play, because I'm like everybody else. I'm thinking, what in the world's going on here? And it turned out being the play that swung that game. Yeah, it's one of the memorable moments, and your voice oh. will live on with that one forever. <laughs> um, well, just talk about kind of your background in broadcasting. How did you get into this? I never took a class. I never took a broadcasting class. I went to school in several different places and ended up... Um, getting a degree in English literature and a degree in polit political science, which is you know, stuff that I enjoyed, certainly wasn't planning mm -hmm. for, any, for any career. And one summer, I was going to school at the time at the University of Florida, and I broke my leg really pretty badly, and I had to take a year off from school. And I had to find a way to make some money. And somebody told me about a job opening at a radio station in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and it's a great way to make some money and sit around all the time because you know my leg was in a cast so I got started there and then I, I met my wife and she was going to school at Auburn so I moved up there and worked at the station there and got a chance to do a lot of baseball play-by-play -play. my first year doing baseball on the radio for Auburn was Bo Jackson's last right. year at Auburn so uh, got hooked with it there and I've, I've just always worked I've always done news and, and sports and the you know the some sales and the you know, the doing an on-air board shift and stuff, just so I could also have the opportunity to do sports. So there's a lot of there's a lot of pay and dues involved in that. So was there ever any moment when you're a child sitting back thinking, I want to do this, or it just kind of you stumbled upon it? Well, I've always wanted to do it. When I was when I was growing up in Palm Bay, Florida, we lived right across the street, right exactly across the street from the big multiplex sports park. Mm -hmm. You know, four baseball fields, basketball courts, you know, tennis courts, the whole thing. And uh, I could walk across the street and be right there. I remember I was playing uh, Babe Ruth League baseball, mm -hmm. and there was always four games a day, and we'd play our game, and they'd need somebody to go up there in the little rickety <laughs> shack above the concession stand and do the public address. And I lived right across, I said, I'll do it. And I'd do three games a day and, and got to where I really enjoyed it. You got paid a snow cone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I always thought, boy, this would be a great way to spend your life doing something like this and, and get paid for it. And it's not even really like work. So that's really how it got okay. started. And now, The People Files. Started off with your favorite movie. Favorite movie is It's a Wonderful Life. Okay. Always tear up at that one. All right. Uh, last book you read. Still reading it. Uh, there's, I'm always reading a book. That's the best part about this job is, is, is the love of the language. The last book I, that I really, really enjoyed was A Year in Provence okay. by uh, Peter Mayo. Your favorite food? <sighs> Boy, I probably grilled chicken. I eat a, I eat a bunch of grilled okay. chicken. <laughs> uh, your favorite music? I listen to all of it. That's my radio background. I've, done, I've been on the air and, and doing on-air ships for classical music and big bands and oldies and album rock and hard rock and all that kind of stuff. Whenever I'm in my truck and I'm driving, I usually listen to classical music. Okay. Uh, and what do you like to do in your free time? 
such that I have, I, I, like, I like to run. I run a lot, usually about 28, 30 miles a week. It's, it's relaxing, it's just, it's just me time, it's alone time. So, you know, whenever we're on the road somewhere with basketball or football or baseball and I've got some free time, I'm usually out running. All right, well Barry, thank you for joining us. And uh, where can the fans uh, in Troy listen to you this year? Well, we get started uh, on, again, on Saturday mm -hmm. and it's, <laughs> it's nine months worth of Troy Athletics. Our flagship station is 94.7 FM, WTBF. All right, Barry, well, thank you, and uh, stay tuned for what's coming up this week in Troy Sports.